This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, share with you some Devei Torah on Parshas Truma. What's uh, amazing is if someone were to be stopped on a street corner and be asked, which subject in the Torah should occupy the most real estate? After all, we know the Torah is the mind of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So probably whichever subject is spoken about the most is the most important subject in the Torah and is most dear to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and is the most important thing for us to know about. I believe the last subject anybody would ever pick would be the Mishkan. Would anybody ever think that the Mishkan should occupy the most space of any subject in the whole Torah? Maybe somebody would say, Shabbos, keeping Shabbos after all, Shabbos is the centerpiece of our Amuna, the centerpiece of our faith, and the Torah does speak about Shabbos in a number of places, and yet if you were to gather all of the various psukim that speak about Shabbos, in Yisroi, in Vaschanan, in Kisisa, Vayakel, you wouldn't even get a whole parak, let alone a whole parsha. We know the most important mitzvah in the Torah is Talmud Torah, the study of Torah. The Torah speaks about the importance of learning in dozens and dozens of places. And yet if you were to gather all the psukim that speak about learning Torah, you would not even have an entire parsha. And yet the subject that occupies the most real estate in the whole Torah is the Mishkan. Is it really that important? I mean, we don't even have the Mishkan anymore. The Mishkan only stood for 40 years. And every single year we come back to the shul, we come back to the shul, and we read the dimensions of the Mishkan. I mean, do you know the dimensions of your house? You know your lot size? You know your house size? You know your dining room table size? You know your dresser size? You know the exact measurements? Do you review it every year? If you do, you need therapy. I mean, do you measure your candelabra? Do you measure the light bulbs in your house? Then you need serious help. And yet every single year, we come back to the same parashiyos, and we, tell, we say, well, the Arayin is two and a half, by one and a half, by one and a half, the Shulchan is two by one, by one and a half. The Menorah had exactly 22 bulbs. It had 22 uh, Gevi'im. And X number of kaftoyrim, and X number of prachim. I mean, do you know the exact number of crystals on your candelabra? Did you ever even count them? You have a piece of paper that you review annually? Who does that? And the Mishkan, every year, we read again and again, uh, uh, 48 krushim, and this number of sockets, and the tapestries, and the curtains, and all the details. And not only do we do it in Truma, then we have a parsha of what the Kohen Gadol wears when he does the Avoida. Do you have a list of the different clothing that you wear on different days of the year? Don't answer that question. <laughs> and then we, we, re, we review it as if you might have forgotten it. We have Vayakel, and we have Pekude. This literally occupies more territory, ten times more territory than Shabbos, than Talmud Torah. Keep it of aim, right? It's important to honor your father and mother. So here it goes. Honor your father and your mother. Uh, Shabbos. Oh, right. Laman Yarich and Yomecha. Thank you. And Shabbos, a few times, Zarchus Yama Shabbos, the Kadsha and Parshas Truma, we have 96 psukim, and then 101 psukim in Tetzaveh, and 100 psukim in Vayakel, and we have to review it again and again and again. What are all of these details about? So here goes. If you don't know the answer to this question, then we're missing the most fundamental and important principle in the whole Torah. Because clearly the Mishkan is the focus of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And it needs to be our focus. And why should it be our focus if we don't even have a Mishkan anymore? Here's a very important diok. Please take a look at number one. God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, K'choyel asher ani mare, in accordance with everything that I show, oisicha. 
Now, grammatically, it should say, Kachal asher ani mara licha, in accordance with everything I show to you. But this Pasuk literally is translated, in accordance with everything that I show you. I show you, as if God is saying, I'm showing you, you. Huh? What does that mean? Also, I'm sure we're all familiar with the famous diok of the Al Shech HaKadosh, the Asuli Mikdash, make for me the sanctuary, Vishachanti, and I will dwell, not B'Soychai, not in it, not in the sanctuary, but B'Soycham, in them, in the Jewish people. To which the Al Shech HaKadosh says, this teaches us that God doesn't dwell in buildings, He doesn't dwell on tables, He doesn't dwell in boxes, He doesn't dwell on cherubs, He dwells on the Jewish people. And this is the opening idea mentioned in the Chumash. The first encounter we have with God in the Chumash is Veruach Eloikim Rachefes, God's hovering. What does hovering mean? He's floating, he has nowhere to land. Why does he have nowhere to land? Let him land on the water. There are many, there are many planes that are able to land on the water. Birds are able to land on the water. Why can't God land on the water? I heard from Rabbi Victor Miller, Zechazak Bracha, because God doesn't rest on water. He doesn't rest on trees. He doesn't rest on things. He rests on Jewish people. And there were no Jewish people. And therefore God is hovering. Therefore the Gemara tells us about the importance of the mitzvah of procreating, pruravu. The Gemara says, the more one increases in pruravu, the more Jews there are in the world, the more God is in the world. The less one engages in that, they diminish the presence of Hashem in the world. The Klal Yisrael, a Jew, is the resting place of the Shechina. Now the question is, little old me, why would God want to rest on me? Here I get up in the morning, and I open up the Siddur, and is this really, is God really waiting for me to say these words? Is he waiting the whole night for me to get up, to be able to say these brachos and these tefillos and do certain mitzvahs? Am I really the center of God's attention? And therefore, the Rebbe Hashem says, listen here, listen up. I want you to know that you are the centerpiece of the universe. Yes, mitzvahs are important. Talmud Torah, so I'll give you a few psukim about Talmud Torah and one pasuk about Kibbutz Avaim. And I'll give you a few psukim about Shabbos. But it all comes back to, why would we want to keep any of it unless we really believe that we are valued to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore the Rav Shalom says, I am going to now give you four parshiyos of the most important subject in Kala Tarakula. And that is, you. We have to know who we are. So who are we? Because if we don't value ourselves, why would we want to do mitzvahs? Why would we think our mitzvahs are cherished by Hashem if we don't value ourselves? The Mishkan is a mashal, it's a parable, it's a semblance. You know who the Mishkan is a parable to? You. So you know why this is the most important subject in the Torah? Because you cannot begin to serve Hashem unless you first identified who you are. And once we recognize who we are, then we could imagine and get a glimpse, well, maybe Hashem is valuing what I do. So let's start with Rabbeinu B'chayi. Rabbeinu B'chayi was one of the great Rishonim, the Chassam Soifer, uh, very much cherished the commentary of Rabbeinu B'chayi. Uh, the Chassam Soifer learned the parish Rabbeinu B'chayi every single Friday night for 40 years. Says Rabbeinu B'chayi, the Mishkan has three parts to it. You have within the Paraiches, meaning behind the curtain of the Paraiches, the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies. In, there you had the Arain, the Kruvim, the Kapoiras. You have outside of the Paraiches, which is the Oyal Moed. What did you have in the Oyal Moed? You had the Menorah, you had the, uh, the Shulchan, and the Mizbeach HaKatoiras. And then you had the Chatzar, and the Chatzar was the Mizbeach HaOyla. These are the three parts of the Mishkan. They correspond to the three parts of reality, three parts of existence. You have something called Olam HaMalachim, the world of the angels. That corresponds to the Kodesh HaKadoshim, 
the Holy of Holies, followed by Olam HaGalgalim, the, the world of the orbs. We have the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the celestial bodies. And then you have this lowly world, Olam HaTachtoin, the Olam HaAsiya. Each realm of existence corresponds to another part of the Mishkan. In other words, the Mishkan is a microcosm of the whole universe. You ever hear the Gemara? The Gemara says, who built the Mishkan? Who is the chief architect? Betzalel. The Gemara says, Betzalel hoyo yoideya letzarev bohem ha'oisiyos shenivru bohem shemayi ba'aretz. Betzalel knew how to combine the letters with which God created heaven and earth. So you read that Gemara, you say, well, good for him, whippy do. I'm glad to know that he knew how to do that. Why do I need to know that Betzalo knew how to put together those letters? The answer is, the Mishkan was a microcosm of the universe. So in order to create a miniature universe, you need to know how to create the universe. So Betzalo needed to know how to combine the letters with which God created heaven and earth. But the universe and the Mishkan are a mashal to man. So man has three parts. You have the mind. The mind is a Kodesh HaKadosh. That is why the tefillin go on the head. The mind is the Holy of Holies. The tzitz was worn on the forehead of the Kayin Gadol. It said Kodesh Lashem. However holy the Holy of Holies was, it's only a mashal to how holy your mind is. Okay? So next time you want to know, should I think about that? Should I watch that? Should I look at that? The barometer should be, would I look at that? Would I watch that in the Kodesh HaKadoshim? Would I sit in the Kodesh HaKadoshim and watch something indecent? <laughs> Got to be out of your mind. How could you let that in your mind, which is holier than the Kodesh HaKadoshim? The Kodesh HaKadoshim is merely a parable so that we can recognize the sanctity of our own minds. That's the... Kodesh HaKadoshim of the human being. And then you have the Menorah, the Shulchan, and the Mezbech HaKadoshim. That's the main part of the body. Where you have the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, the main organs. That's the next part of the body. That corresponds to the Kodesh. And then the lower part of the body, which Rabbeinu Bechayi says, on the one hand, that's the part of the body that decomposes first, because that's where all the digestion takes place. On the other hand, that's the part that creates next generation. But it's because of decomposition that requires the need for procreation. And that is the Mizbeach HaOila. The Mizbeach HaOila consumed all the food on the Mizbeach, and at the same time, it brought vitality to the whole world that God should continue pumping vitality into the world. So the three parts of man are alluded to in the three parts of the Mishkan. Let's bring this to the next level. We know there are various individuals who carry different parts of the Mishkan. You had Elazar. Elazar carried the Shem and Lamar. He carried the oil. He carried the Ketoyres. He carried the Shem and Hamishcha. Then, a little bit lower, the most prized family of Levi, Kahas. Kahas carried the Arain, the Shulchan, the Menoira, the Mezbechais. Now, listen to what the Kuzari writes. The same way the human body has structural parts, has functional parts, has life force, could you point to the life force? You can't point to the life force. Life force is an intangible. But the life force is what gives vitality to the whole being. Then you have vital organs. The heart, the, the brain, the lungs. Then you have the skin, which sort of houses it all together. Then you have the bones that hold it up. They're purely structural. The same thing in the Mishkan. The Mishkan, the life force of the Mishkan, was the oil that anointed everything and sanctified everything. The life force of the Mishkan was the Ketoyres that imbued the whole building with the sanctified aroma. That was carried by Elazar ben Aaron Akoin. He carried the life of the Mishkan. He was carrying the Chaim of the Mishkan. 
Then Kahas. Kahas carried the vital organs of the Mishkan. The Aroin, the Shulchan, the Menorah. Gershaim carried the hides and the curtains that coated the Mishkan. That was the skin of the Mishkan. And then Merari carried the beams. Those are the bones. So the Mishkan literally is a mashal to the human body. The Mishkan had chayus, it had life force, it had vital organs, it had skin, and it had uh, the bones, which are the krashim. Comes Reb Chaim Velazhenar. If you take a look at number 7. And Reb Chaim Velazhenar writes such ennobling words, such powerful words. He says, Gam al zois yecharad lev ha'adam e'am ha'kodesh. For this, the heart of the human mind should tremble. Shehu koilel betavnisoi kol ha'koychos v'ha'ilamais kulam. Man, a human being, encompasses the entirety of the world because the Mishkan is a microcosm of the universe. And the Mishkan is a mashal to man. So if you wanted to know how great man was and you look at the whole universe, the whole universe is encompassed in the Mishkan. And the whole universe and the whole Mishkan is merely a mashal to man. And therefore, says Rav Chaim and this is a very powerful idea. Says Rav Chaim when Titus Harasha went into the Holy of Holies with a Zaina and committed the unspeakable, wrapped in a Sefer Torah, you would think that's pretty bad. That was nothing. That's almost, that's innocuous, relative to a Jew who allows an impure thought to enter their mind that's much more poisonous, that's much more dangerous than what Titus HaRasha did. You know why? Because Titus only brought the Zaina into the parable, into the mashal. But the whole Mishkan is merely a mashal to the sanctity of the mind of a Jew. So if Titus was not allowed to do that, then alachas kama v'kama, all the more so, kal v'choymer, a person has to guard the purity of their mind because the mind is much more sanctified than the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Kodesh HaKadoshim is merely a parable to the human mind. Or next time a person is angry, not in Flatbush, it doesn't happen in Flatbush, but in other neighborhoods, sometimes people have a challenge with kas. Now, kas is a fire. Kas is an ish. What would happen if somebody went into the Mishkan on a random Tuesday and he had this fire pan, this shovel, and on the shovel was uh, some really nice smelling things that he got in the department store and he opens up this perfume and he pours it on the uh, (laughs) fire pan and he brings in what is called an ish zara into the Mishkan. So what's going to happen to this guy? He's done. You know, lightning bolt comes down from the heavens and it's all over. You can't bring in a foreign fire into the... So, says of Chaim Velazhenar, just imagine when a person allows the fire of Kas to enter their personal Kodesh HaGadoshim, their holy space. That's much worse than bringing the Eish Zara into the Kodesh HaGadoshim. The whole subject of the Mishkan, the whole subject of the Beis HaMikdash is merely a parable to the greatness of the human being, the greatness of a Jew. If you look at number 8 in the Reish Chachma, Reish Chachma was written by a contemporary of the Arizal, Rabbi Eliyahu Dividas. He's buried in the city of, Tzva, of Hebron. He writes as well, Iker diras hashchina eina ela benefesh hazaka. The main residence of the Shekhinah is in the pure soul. That's what it means, Va'asuli mikdash v'shachanti b'soicham. God doesn't dwell in the heavens, He doesn't dwell in a building, He doesn't dwell on stones. The idea that we make a house for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to come into is only to give us a glimpse into the idea that Hashem actually rests on us. Now here's the highlight. Many years ago, I was in my grandparents' house and there was a big bookcase and on the bottom shelf there was a little red sefer and it had in it all the books of Rabbi Yeshua Heller. Rabbi Yeshua Heller was a student of the Rabbi David Tevel 
who is a student of Chaim Velazhenar, who is a student of the Gain, of the Vilna Gain. And he wrote many amazing Svarim. He was the brother of Rabbi Yechiel Heller, who wrote the Amud Ar. And actually, he had two other very illustrious brothers. And the fact that there were four great G'day Yisrael in one family is a story in and of itself. Rabbi Shua Heller's mother was a very learned mother, a very learned woman, a very intelligent woman, and even as a teenager, everyone knew she was going to marry a God of Yisrael. And as soon as she started the parsha of dating, somebody spread a rumor about her, destroyed her reputation, and she couldn't find the shidduch. She would only be able to marry a complete Amma Aretz. She couldn't even marry the wagon driver. The wagon driver was too chasha for her, so she married the shamish of the wagon driver, the guy who swept up everything the wagon driver left behind. And her whole life she davened, I bear the insult of this false rumor, I wasn't zaycha to marry a Talmud Chacham, at least allow my children to be Talmud Chachamim. And she was zaycha to produce four of the all-time great Talmud Chachamim, one of them was Rabbi Chiel Heller, who signed off every tshuva, Ha'olov, Rabbi Chiel Heller, the insulted one, Rabbi Chiel Heller, because his mother would always say the following tefillah, Vila aluvas nefesh toishia. God, save the afflicted, save the afflicted, save the afflicted. And Rabbi Chiel Heller would sign off all of his tshuvas, uh, Ha'olov, the afflicted one, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Chiel Heller. So Rabbi Shua Heller, the author of Ayol Yehoshua, he has a, an amazing thesis that he develops. How the Beis HaMikdash is a parable, how the Beis HaMikdash is a paradigm of the human body. And he basically starts off that the whole Beis HaMikdash is reflective, is a mashal, to the human face. The human face is the Mikdash, the Mishkan, where the Shekhinah rests. And the face itself has three parts. The first part is the forehead. In the forehead, there's a brain, you hope. And the brain consists of three parts. There's the brain covered by two membranes. In Kabbalah, it's called Chachma, Bina, and Das. That corresponds to the Aroin and the two Kruven. That's the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Your mind is the Kodesh HaKadoshim. That's the Holy of Holies. So, Rabbi Shua Heller says, the next time you want to know, should I think about this? Should I let this into my mind? Should I let this brew in my head? A person has to view, have an attitude toward, toward their mind of, uh, that it's the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Next, says Rabbi Shua Heller, what part of the body gives a person the most trouble of any other chilek of the guf uh, in terms of spirituality. My eyes cause me more trouble than any other part of the city. In other words, the eyes get us into a bigger mess than anything else. Why? Because you're in your house, you're minding your own business, you do what you got to do, but all of a sudden you see this, and you want that, and this person did this, and she did that, and this person has this, the eyes cause the most trouble. Now, there are two problems the eyes could cause. Number one, improper gazing, improper looking, looking at something indecent. And the other kind of trouble is stinginess. Tsaros ha'ayin, being stingy. Why do they have that? Why did they marry off before? Why did they do this? Why is their house bigger than mine? Why do they drive X, Y, and Z? The eyes cause more trouble than anything else. Now, the forehead is the arayin and the two kruven. Chachma binandas. We now move on to the eyes. The eyes represent, it's very interesting, if you go into the Kodesh, the Kodesh has two vessels that are exactly opposite each other, and they are the Menorah, the Menorah in the, in, the, in the Daraim, in the south, and the Shulchan in the Tzafayim. Right, the Gemara says, you know, if you're davening Shemona Esrei, should you tilt to the north or should you tilt to the south? 
So the Gemara says, if you tilt to the north, you'll have money. If you tilt to the south, you'll have wisdom. And if you go straight forward, you won't have anything. <laughs> right? So, and the Gemara says, how do you remember if you tilt to the north, you'll have money. If you tilt to the south, you'll have wisdom. Haroitze lehachkim, if you want to be wise, yadrim, face the south. Vesimonech, the simon is, menara shabadarim, the menara in the south. That's why Jews go to Miami Beach. Then, the shulchan is in the north. The shulchan is in the north because haroitze lehaash, if you want to become wealthy, yatspin, you face the north. Vesimonech, shulchan shabbat safin. It's broad in shulchan arach. You, tell, you face Mizrach, but if you want to tilt a little bit, you want wisdom, which I recommend money's not going to do anything for you anyway, especially if you don't have wisdom. So, you face the Daraim, you face a little bit the south, the Simanach Menorah Shabbat. Now, in between the Menorah and the Shulchan was the Mizbech HaKetairas. Says the Gemara, was the Mizbech HaKetairas exactly in between? No, says the Gemara. Ki hechi the Ahadadi. The Menorah and the Shulchan need to see each other. Says Rabbi Shuhela, that means the Menorah and the Shulchan are the two human eyes. Our two eyes, one eye is a Menorah and one eye is a Shulchan. Now, the eyes cause us trouble in two ways. We could look at something indecent. The way to rectify that is the Menorah. The Menorah represents the wisdom of the Torah. The, when Rav Tarfain heard a good kasha, Rav Tarfain would say, Kaftor v'ferach, buttons and knobs. What, what, those are referring to the buttons and knobs of the menorah, indicating that through the buttons and designs of the menorah, Chachmas HaTorah came down to the world. The Shulchan brought Ashiros. What's the way to overcome stinginess of the eye? You open up your house, you sit on Niyam at your table, you serve them lavishly, and you overcome stinginess. So the menorah helps you overcome indecent gazing, and the shulchan helps you overcome stinginess of the eye. These are the two eyes. Eye number one is the menorah, eye number, one is the sh- eye number two is the shulchan. Now, they're right opposite each other, like the two eyes. And which kli in the mishkan was a little bit further down, not interposing in between the two eyes? Mizbeach HaKetoyres, the scent, the scent Mizbeach. The Mizbeach HaKetoyres was the nose. And what's the mouth? The mouth is the Mizbeach HaOyla. The, the Mizbeach HaOyla was always eating, it's always consuming. So if you wanted to know, how holy am I? How important is my Avodah Hashem? How chashuv is my tefillah? How chashuv is my Tikkun Hamidais. Am I important to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Says God, I want you to know something. Shabbos? It's very important. Here's a few psukim on Shabbos. Learning Torah? It's wonderful. Here are a dozen psukim about learning Torah. Honor your father and mother? It's terrific. Here it goes. Kabed es avicha v'yesimecha. And you? You want to know how chashuv you are? You want to know how important you are? You want to know how valuable you are to me? You want to know how holy you are? You are Parshas Truma, Titsana, Vayakel, Pekude, the largest subject in the Torah. You are the Mishkan. The, the Mishkan is nothing compared to you. You know, people go to the Kaisa HaMaravi and they, get, they take it very seriously, which they should. And they stand there in awe and reverence. And you know, I hate to break it to you, this, the Kaisa HaMaravi is not the wall of the Beis HaMikdash. It's the retaining wall of the Harabayas. And yet, because it's the nearest wall to what once was the base Hamikdash and doesn't stand anymore, people treat it with great reverence. And imagine how much respect one would have toward the base Hamikdash itself. The first principle in Yahados is that an Adam is a Beis Hamikdash. And whatever holiness we ascribe to the Beis Hamikdash, to the Kruvim, to the Arain, to the Kodesh HaKadoshim, and we have a very, um, we're in awe of the Holy of Holies. We know the Kain Gadol could only go in once a year, and if he would take a misstep, it would be very dangerous. Then why should we treat our own minds every different, any different? You think you could just sit back, kick back, turn something on. It could be the most indecent, despicable thing possible. I'm just watching it. I'm just looking at it. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? The barometer should be, would I take this in 
in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. That's how a person should live there. Would I say this in the Kodesh HaKadoshim? Would I say this in a Mikdash? Now this is Oyo in God created us in His image. So I guess, if we can say such a thing, God's structure that He allows us to think of Him in has how many limbs? Well, we know we have 248 Avarim and 365 Gidim, 365 sinews. Says Rabbi Shuahela, you know, thinking about this idea, that the Mishkan is merely a paradigm and parable to man, and the Krushim are the bones of man, <laughs> and the Menorah and the, Shul- and the Shulchan are the eyes of man, and the Mizbeach HaKetores is man's nose. Let's, ca- let's make a little cheshben. Let's count up all the components and segments of the Mishkan. So, it's your lucky day. If you take a look on page 5, Rabbi Shua Heller makes a remarkable cheshben. Says Rabbi Shua Heller, there are 48 krushim, 48 beams, going in the south and in the north and in the west. You have 100 sockets, you have 10 curtains, you have 100 lula'ais, lula'ais the, the clasps of blue wool. You have 50 gold clasps, you have 11 curtains of the, of the, from the goats, you have another 100 lulais, you have 50 clasps of copper, you have 15 brichim, brichim were the poles that went through the walls of the Mishkan. Then you have 96 rings, and one paroiches, and four pillars, and four hooks, and one front curtain, and five sockets and five beams in the front, and one aroin, and one kapoires, and the kruvim, and the shulchan, and the menoira, and the mezveach haktoires, and the mezveach ha'oila, and the kiar, says Rabbi Shua Heller, from the time that Moshe Rabbeinu gave us the Torah 3,300 years ago, Nobody has ever revealed to the world that the number of components in the Mishkan were exactly the number of parts of the human body, namely Taryag, 613. Why? Is it a coincidence? that there just happens to be 613 parts of the human body and 613 parts of the Mishkan? No, the answer is, if we don't understand this, we don't know what the Mishkan is. The Mishkan is me. The Mishkan is you. God says, K'chol asher ani mare, not licha. I'm not going to show this building to you. K'chol asher ani mare, oischa. I am now showing you. You want to know who you are? You don't want to know how important you are? You want to know how holy you are? You want to know how sanctified you are? Your eyes, your mouth, your nose, your senses. I'm just, I just looked at it. I just listened to it. What's the big deal? Does it really matter? The sense of a human being is a holy hargasha. The vision, the hearing, the thoughts. Tell you, uh, I'll end off with this, an amazing marsha. You know, there's a mitzvah, you have a guest come to your house, so you have to, there's a mitzvah to escort them out of the door. Especially if they're there too long. No, no, there's a, the mitzvah of levaya, the mitzvah of escorting. You give, them to, you give them food, you give them drink, and you walk them out. Why? To protect them. I don't know, the guy's walking 500 miles, and you're escorting them dalet amos, and you're protecting them, how are you protecting them? They're about to walk through inner city, and you're walking them four amos in the streets of Flatbush. What protection are you going to give them? Listen to this marsha. The marsha says, well, if you take a few steps with them, you show you want to protect them. God looks down on high and He says, oh, the host wants to protect the guest. This host is a God-fearing person. Ritzayin, I will now fulfill the desire of the host who wants to protect this person. And therefore, this person will then be protected for the rest of the day. So we read this and we say, really? That, does, that, does that really make sense? Am I so important that my Ratzayin is so dear to HaKadosh Baruch Hu 
that he's going to protect this person the whole day because of my little gesture? We don't understand it. We don't almost believe it because we don't recognize our own greatness. We don't put full energy and enthusiasm into our Vedas Hashem because deep down we think to ourselves, is what I'm doing so important? And therefore the Rav Hashem says, let me tell you what the most important subject in the whole Torah is. It's not learning Torah. It's not honor your father and mother. It's not love your no, no, uh, friend like yourself. It's not tefillin, it's not Shabbos candles, it's not challah. The most important concept in the Torah is recognizing your value to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How valuable are you? You are the Mishkan, you are the Mikdash. Kachal Asher Ani Mare Oischa. The 613 segments of gold, silver, copper are just to give you an inkling of your own holiness. And what we wouldn't do in a Mishkan, of course we can't do. You know, if you ask most people, what's holier? The Mishkan? Or the guy sitting next to me in Shul, or the woman sitting next to me in Shul, or by Chachmas Nashim. Of course, the Beis HaMikdash is much holier. Sheker V'chazav. It's apikarsis to say that. It's not true. If the Mishkan was burning down on Shabbos, you couldn't put out the fire. And if your friend's life might be in danger, you have to be Mechal Shabbos. So of course, a Jew is holier than Beis HaMikdash. The whole purpose of the Beis HaMikdash, it's just a mashal to recognize how important we are to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which occupies more real estate than any other subject in the Torah. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Shkayach. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.